Okay, so today's daf is Ayin Bet. We're starting from the new Mishnah. Chamisha Chaburot. This is Chamisha Chaburot, five groups. Shishavitu Betraklin Echad. So what this is dealing with is we know that if you have multiple houses that they open to one chatzer, one courtyard, they require a Ruvei Chatzerot. But how do you define multi, how do you define a dwelling? Okay, so for example, like let's take the most extreme example that we know the answer to this. Let's say you had an apartment building with uh, 25 apartments. So we know that we treat the apartments as distinct. We don't treat that. And, and let's say the apartment building opens to a, court, uh, a chatzer. So everybody who has an apartment, they come into a main area. They, they come out of their apartment into the lobby. And the lobby opens to the, to the courtyard. That, and this courtyard is shared by other buildings. Okay, so there we know, we don't say that each apartment, that since we all live in the same big building, we're all one group. We say each apartment is distinct. So you would need an Eruve Chatzerot for the building, for within the building, among, among the Dirot, among the, uh, the apartments. Plus, they need to participate in the Eruv for the courtyard outside the building that's shared with other buildings. Okay, so there's a part that just the members of that apartment building use. And then there's the outside that's used by other buildings, let's say. <clears throat> so that's obvious. But what about within one structure? You have five groups who are all living in the building, but they don't have clearly defined apartments. Okay? So how do you know when it's considered all one group and when it's considered five groups? That's what the Mishnah is dealing with. So five groups who are staying in one palace. Traklin is like a big building. Okay? So according to Beit Shammai, you need an Eruv for each group. Which means, to carry in between the groups, or inside that building, you need an Eruv. Because each group is considered separate. And if they want to join with the Eruv Echatzerot outside their building... Each group has to participate separately. You can't send one loaf of bread for everybody. Each group, each of the five groups has to participate. So they're totally independent. It's like having five houses. They're inside one structure, but they're five houses. Just like apartments. Now, And Beit Hillel says, the entire group is one. Now obviously, as the Gebarah is going to explain, we're not talking about where they really have separate apartments. Because if they had separate apartments, then ev- everyone would agree that they sh- the space that they share, they need an Eruv. And everybody would agree that they need to independently participate in an Eruv for outside the building. That's no question. But we're going to see why it's different here. That's what I just said, okay? Everybody agrees if they live in separate apartments inside this building, or aliyot, an attic, or whatever, that definitely they're considered separate groups. So the fact that they're all in one building doesn't mean they're all one group if they have separate apartments. The question is, where do we draw the line? Okay? And apparently Beit Shammai draws the line sooner than Beit Hillel does. Beit Shammai is quicker to say they are separate groups than Beit Hillel is. The question is, where does he draw the line exactly? Okay, that's what's not clear. So the Gemara says, Amar Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman comes to deal with this problem. Okay, everybody agrees if they live in separate apartments, they're independent. So when, and everybody agrees if they're all one family, they're one group. So where's the line being drawn then? So Rav Nachman says, Machloket b'mesifas. When is the machloket? If you have a, you, you separate the area between them with misifas. Misifas is little pieces of wood. So there's not a real wall. Like imagine the best example would be like, you know those orange cones that they use for construction? Yeah. Right? Let's say you put orange cone. You have like a big uh, area, like, you know, lavdil, you know, like one of those homeless shelters, you know, those big areas that they have. You know, or in disaster shelters where they just take a huge area and they just divide it up among people. So you take cones and you make an area for one group. You take cones. So it's a small, it's not really a wall. And it's not ten tefachim. It's only, a, it's short. But you're delineating an area. So that's where the machloket is, says Rav Nachman. 
In other words, that about the mechitza asara, divreyakol eruv lekol chabura v'chabura. So according to Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, this is where the machloket is, where you have a short delineation of the area, but where you have a mechitza, where you have a ten tefach high wall separating the groups, even Beit Hillel is going to agree. Those are separate groups. Just like apartments. So where's the distinction? Where's, where does he draw the line? He draws a line when you have a wall of ten tefachim. A wall of ten tefachim that's already a separate apartment. Anything less than that, Beit Hillel will say, since you have a delineation. I'm sorry, Beit Shammai will say, since you're delineating them with cones or whatever you're using, they're separate. Beit Hillel will say, no, 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 until you have a ten tefachai wall, they're together. That's, that's interpretation number one. Ika de Amre, another alternative interpretation is, Amar Rav Nachman, af ben misifas machloket. That Rav Nachman didn't say that they only argue in a case where you have the little cones or the little pieces of wood. He said, af ben misifas machloket. That they argue in all cases. They argue if you have a mechitza, that's sent to and they even argue... In a case where you have the small pieces of wood. So Rashi explains, That Beit Shammai disagree. In other words, Beit Shammai is so strict that even when all you have is a little, certainly when there's a mechitza of ten tefachim, Beit Shammai is going to say that's a separate group. But even when the cone, you have little cones or you have little pieces of wood, even there Beit Shammai is going to be strict. Okay? And Beit Hillel is also going to, is going to be lenient in both cases it seems like. Whether you have a Mechitza Asara or you have a Mesifas or you have these little pieces of wood, Beit Hillel is going to say it's still not enough of a separation. That's what it seems to be saying. Okay? After Mesifas, even, meaning in both cases, there's a Machloket. <clears throat> now, Pligi bar Rabbi Chiyav, Rabbi Shimon. We have Berabi. We have two more opinions about what the Machloket is in the Mishnah. It's very unclear because when you read the Mishnah, it's clear what they agree on, which is when you have separate apartments. But it's not so clear what the case is that they're arguing about. So, the, so there's another two opinions. So, there, there's, one says that the machloket is where you have walls that reach the sky, reach the ceiling. But if they're anything less than reaching the ceiling, everybody agrees that they're not separate. Okay? Everybody agrees they're not separate. And the other one says, no, 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 the other way around. When the walls don't reach the sky, that's where they argue. When they reach the sky, everybody agrees they are separate. Okay, so you have four different opinions here. Four different views about how to interpret the, uh, the, the argument in the Mishnah. So we turn to Amud Bet. Metivet, there is an objection. Amar Rabbi Yehuda Hasabar. Rabbi Yehuda, the explainer, Hasabar, says... Now this sides with one of the opinions, as we're going to see. Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel didn't argue in a case where the walls reach the ceiling. That you need a separate eruv for each group. The groups are totally separate. They're separate. Where did they argue? When the mechitzot don't reach the ceiling. If they don't reach the ceiling, that according to Beit Shammai, every Chavura requires their own Eruv. Because there are walls. These walls don't reach the ceiling. Okay? But they're still walls. And Beit Hillel says that, that's a, that, that the fact that they don't reach the ceiling means that they're all one. They're all united. So they only need one Eruv. But if they reach the ceiling, there everybody agrees they're distinct. Okay? Now, now we can use this baraita to reject some of the opinions that were proposed before. Because all the opinions that were proposed before for explaining Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel were coming from Amoraim. 
They were coming from later generation rabbis. This is a Brayta. This is coming from the rabbis of the Mishnah. So it's excluding some of the opinions. One of the opinions said, that they argue even in a case where the walls reach the ceiling, that Beit Hillel still said that they were considered all one group because they're in one, one building. So he says, no, Tiyuvta. This shows you, Rabbi Yehuda Sabar's explanation shows you that that's not the case. In the case where the walls reach the ceiling, everybody agrees they're separate groups. And the, on the previous Amud, we said that one of the Amoraim said, their argument is where the walls don't reach the ceiling. This is a support for it, because that's exactly what Rabbi Yehuda Sabar is saying. That when the walls reach the ceiling, they're separate. But when they don't reach the ceiling, that's where the argument is. Now, according to the first view of Rav Nachman, that where do they argue? The Misifas. The only case where they argue is where there's a low, kind of a makeshift wall of pieces of wood, or like we said, like the cones delineating the area. But where there's a 10 tefa high wall, everyone agrees the groups are separate. You see from Rabbi Yehuda Sabar that that's not the case. The only time they agree that every, each group is separate is when the walls reach the ceiling. Not just being ten to Fahim. I remember living in a chatzel like this with five, six families. We all had our own units. You know? Even the unit itself sometimes had two different families living in one unit. It's a good question. It's a good question. It seems like they could have done that too. Yeah, based on yeah it's, a, it's a good question. The next Mishnah is going to talk a little bit more about ownership and uh, how do you define a family. What if you have you know kids, but they live on their own, but they live in the chatzel, but they you know but the dad is there you know. So it's going to talk more about that aspect of it. Now lahak lishana the amar of Nachman af. So so we've knocked out two out of the four opinions, right? Because this this Braita is siding with. The side that says that if the walls reach the ceiling, that's the time that they agree that they're separate. When the walls don't reach the ceiling, that's where the machloket is. Okay? But what about the other view, the other version of Rav Nachman, where he said, even b'misifas is a machloket, meaning that Beit Shammai goes so far that even if all they have are the cones, you know, the, the very low delineation of an area, that's enough to make it separate. And certainly if it's any higher than that, that's going to make it separate. Do we have to say that this is, this is refuted here? It, not necessarily right away, because Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, even according to this, argue on anything less than reaching the ceiling. So they could argue as, you know, even on the lowest uh, thing. It's not so clear that they that this would be refuted. Amar lach Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman will tell you, pligi b'mechitza, vuadin b'mesifas. Because Rav Nachman could say that they argue about a wall, but a little makeshift wall or a, an area of cones would be the same. Ve'had de kamipal ge b'mechitza lo diachak kochan de betilel. And the reason why they choose the case of a wall is to show you the strength of betilel. Betilel is so lenient that even with a wall, he still says that they're one group. Why don't we choose, why don't Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel argue instead about the cones to show you how strict Beit Shammai is? He's so strict that even with the low pieces of wood, little pieces of wood around, he's going to say that that's a separate area. So why don't we mention that? Koach de hetera adif. General principle in Talmud. We always say koach de hetera adif. That the strength of heter, the strength of permiss- permission, permissibility, is more impressive. Someone who's willing to be lenient is more impressive. Someone who's willing to be stringent, it's easy to be stringent. Be stringent about anything. But somebody who is really, who's lenient, we know that they're taking a position, right? They're being bold. They're being courageous. That's, so that's why we mentioned the case that even when there's a wall, as long as it doesn't reach the ceiling, Beit Hillel is going to say they're all one group, even though really... Uh, really the argument stretches even to the lowest wall. Beit Shammai is so strict that even the lowest wall is still going to be a wall for him, for them. Amar Rav Nachman, Amar Rav. Rav Nachman said in the name of Rav, Halakha Rabbi Yehuda Sabar, the Halakha follows Rabbi Yehuda Sabar. 
that the machloket is walls up to the ce- that don't reach the ceiling. That as long if you have walls but they don't reach the ceiling, that's where Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai are going to argue. If the walls reach the ceiling, no then uh, no argument. It's definitely considered distinct, separate. Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says Matnitin Nami Dika. We can show a proof from our Mishnah. Because it said in the Mishnah that everybody agrees when they live in separate apartments or aliyot or attics that they need a separate eruv for each group. So the Gemara, so the Gemara says, my hadarim or my aliyot. What are these rooms and what are these attics that we're talking about here? If the upper chambers and the rooms are real rooms, so pshita, this is obvious. This is an apartment building. What's a, what's a chidush? Rather, we're talking about even if they lived in sections that were like apartment building, were like apartments, were like chambers. Shemamina, what is that talking about then? The Mishnah, is, the Mishnah is referring exactly to our case, to a case where the walls reach the ceiling. In other words, if they live in a situation where that's similar to having separate apartments. Why is it similar to have separate, having separate apartments? Because it reaches, because the walls reach the ceiling. So you see that our Mishnah supports that that's the case where they all agree. That's not a case where they still have a machloket. So even there, though they're not permanent walls, in other words, they're not really, uh, it's not really separate rooms. These are really just mechitzot that they erected to share the space. Okay, they're sharing really one big space and they're just separating with the groups with these mechitzot with these, that reach the ceiling. Still, that's considered like, according to everybody, like separate apartments. Anything less than that, if they don't reach the ceiling, everyone's to get, considered to be together. <clears throat> okay, now... Tana, we learned in a Braita, or in a Tosefta, when it was this stated. So this is a to- Rashi says this is a totally different interpretation of the, of the Mishnah. Up till now, we've been assuming that what is the issue here? The issue is you have these five groups. They're living in a palace, or in this big, in this big area. So do they have to make an Eruv to, sh- to walk from one group to another? To, within their, their building, they have to make an Eruv. And if they make an Eruv in the courtyard that's shared with other buildings, they, each group has to be represented. Right? So now, we're saying a different interpretation. That within the building, everyone agrees, you don't need an Eruv. Within the building. Okay? Unless they have totally separate apartments that are really separate. Okay? But if you just put up a Mechitza, even if it reaches the ceiling, you don't. So what, are, what the only issue is the chatz, that when they, sent, when they participate in an Eruvei Chatzerot with other buildings. Okay? Bamedvarim amurim kishmo lichinet Eruvan lamakom acher. Aval imaya Eruvan ba etzlan, divrei akol, Eruv echad ukulan. So the, the, this Tosefta is saying that everyone agrees that, in other words, the machloket between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel is where these five groups are making an Eruv with other buildings. They all share. Imagine our synagogue is an apartment building. Okay, or is this, this big building? And you have one group lives over there behind that mechitza, one group lives over there, one group lives here. Now we want to go out of the building into, onto Edson Lane, onto Wood Glen Drive. And we're going to share, you know, uh, we're, that's a chatzer that we share with the other houses. So we want to send our Eruv out and it's going to be in one of the other houses so that we can all share the outside area. Imagine it's fenced in. It's a chatzer. Okay? So, uh, so there, Beit Shammai says, once we're sending out, we have to each send out. Each of the five groups has to send out part of the Eruv. Beit Hillel says, since we're all sending out for our building, we only have to send one. However, if we get to hold the Eruv, because remember, they collected the Eruv and they would pick a house where they would store the Eruv. If our building is where we're storing the Eruv, everyone agrees we don't, we don't, we don't have to have each, per, each group participating. We can keep it here and we're all part of the group, part of one group. But when we send out our Eruv to another house, now each group has to participate according to Beit Shammai. And Beit Hillel says we can all send one. We can also send one loaf of bread or whatever it is to the to the eruv. So if that's the case, so then, 
Um, so then, Keman Azlaha Ditanya. So according to that, according to whom is this Baraita going? This Baraita that's about to be cited. It says, five people or five groups who collect the Eruv to send it to another house. Eruv Echad Kulan. Okay? They only have to send one Eruv for everybody. In other words, if you have five people living in the same building, they only have to send one Eruv. Keman Ke Betilel. This would follow Betilel, because we just said that even the five groups who are living in one building, when they send out the Eruv according to Betilel, they only have to send one. The Ikad Amri, but there's an alternative version. When is the Machloket between Betilel and Beit Shemai? When the Eruv is in our building. That's where, according to Beit Shammai, each group has to participate. And according to Beit Hillel, we're all considered one. The opposite. When we send out our Eruv, now each group has to participate according to everyone. Even according to Beit Hillel. If that's the case... Then keman as the haditanya chamisha shigavot deruvan kibushim olichin deruvan the makom acher eruv echad kulan keman de la kechad. So according to this, then we have a problem because that brayta that said that if five people who live in one building want to send out the eruv that's going to be stored in somebody else's house, the eruv echatzerot the bread that unites all of us to use the chatzer outside, then it said that we only have to send one eruv because we all live in the same building. And after all, there's only one exit from this building to the Chatzer. So even though we're five groups, what difference does it make? This is this for right? The chatzer, right? Right, for, for the Chatzer outside of the building, that we share with other buildings. Okay, Beit, according to this version, both Beit Yilel and Beit Shammai require every group to contribute to that Eruv. And yet the Breita said that when you're sending it out, you only need one for everybody. So that's Dela Kechad. According to the second version... That's nobody's opinion. That's not Beit Hillel and that's not Beit Shammai because the second version said that everybody agrees when you send it out, you need to have representative of all five groups. It's only when it comes to us that we only need one. But when it goes out, everyone is going to agree that you need to send five. So there, that would not follow anyone's opinion. So what we found in today's Gemara, a lot of different versions, right? A lot of different versions of the, of the case in the palace. A, a, a two different versions of what the case is, whether it's talking about the Eruv with other buildings or it's talking about within the building. And then within that, what case are they arguing about? Where they're keeping the Eruv or where they're sending out the Eruv? So it's a very complicated in that sense. It's not that hard to understand, but there's a lot of different possible versions that are being played around with in this Gemara. Now we get to the next Mishnah. This is similar to what you were saying. You have children who eat at their father's table. They sleep in their own house. So they all live in the same courtyard, but they eat at their father's table. Okay? <clears throat> but they have their own sleeping quarters. So, they, they need an Eruv. Each one needs his own Eruv. Let's say he has three sons, or whatever, two sons. So uh, the father, since everybody eats with the father, but they live in their own houses in the courtyard. They have their own apartments that open or their own houses that open to the courtyard separately. So the Mishnah says they need, their own, they need to participate in the Eruv independently. They can't rely on the father. They can't say we're all one group because we all eat with the father. That doesn't work. So, they, they need, so therefore, the Fichach, Im Shachach Echad Mehem Velo Erev Mivatilet Rishuto. So if one of them forgets to participate in the Eruv, it's no good. He has to do what's called bitul reshut, which means he has to give up his rights to the courtyard to the other two in order to allow them to carry. He has to, somebody's got to give. If he forgets, he has to give up his rights. Mm. When is this true? He says, this is only true when they're sending their Eruv to someone else. Okay? In other words, Rashi explains, So according to 
Okay, so what's the point here? The Rashi is saying, let's say the father and the two sons were the only people who lived in the Chatzir. There it's not a problem. But if there were other people living in the Chatzir, so now there's an obligation without this family. So this family has three houses basically in the Chatzir. Right? The father and the two sons. But there are other people living there too. And the Eruv is going to be placed in one of the other houses. Okay? So that's why the two sons, each son has to give and the father has to give. But if the Eruv comes to one of them, they can say we're all together. When it comes to food, they're all together. And the Eruv HaChatzer wrote this food. So they were all together. Or if they're the only people living in the Chatzer, since they're eating with the father, it makes sense. Because the food is what unites you in the Chatzer. And they're all eating with the father. So they could say we're all part of the same group. But once you have extraneous people and the Eruv is going there to the other people, so now each, each family, even though you have three houses in the family, each household has to give. Okay? If it's all in the family, so to speak, either that they're the only people in the Chatzer or that they're the ones holding the Eruv in one of their houses, now they don't need to all participate. So the Gemara says... Shimamina, mekom lina gorem. So, what do you see from this? That what defines separate dwellings for, for the purpose of Eruve Chatzerot? Makom lina, the place you sleep. Because these kids are eating at their father's house. And yet, because they sleep in different rooms, different houses, they're, they're considered to be independent. Amar Rav Yuda, Amar Rav, Rav Yuda said that Rav said, pras shanu. Not necessarily true. Not necessarily true. We're not talking about a case where they actually eat at their father's house. We're talking about a case, mikable paras, that they're supported by the father. They eat in their own home. It could be that we actually go by where you eat. The only thing is, they're supported by the father. So in terms of economically, they're all really one family. The father is giving them money. But practically, they live, they eat and sleep separately. So when we say they eat at their, on their father's table, it doesn't literally mean that, right? It means that they're supported by the father. It's a euphemism. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's a, uh, uh, a figure of speech, right? That they, they, they eat at their father's table. Tan Rabbi and the rabbis taught, Mishi yesh lo bet sha'ar achsadra umir pesed b'chatzer chavero harize in oser alav. If you have a gate, a, a bet sha'ar, a, um, a gatehouse, this is like a, a place that's basically not used for a living, okay, it's not used for dwelling. It's where the guy who guarded the gate would sit. Achsadra, a sort of open area of um, an outdoor area. Umir Pesed, we know what Umir Pesed is, right? It's sort of a porch or whatever. Bechatzer Chavero, in the Chatzer of his friend, Hareze en Oser Alav. Okay? This does not prohibit. The chatzer. In other words, you don't live in the chatzer, but you own some property in the chatzer. But it's not living property. It's just, uh, it's space. That doesn't mean that you interfere with the other b'nei chatzer. You're not considered to live there. Beta teven, beta bakar, beta aitzim, or beta otsarot. If you have a straw storage, or a, uh, a cattle, you have cattle there. Or you have a place where you store wood, or a place where you store other food, beta otzarot, you store other things, hareze oser alav. That prohibits the other people. In other words, that's considered like you have a dwelling in the chatzer. That's considered a dwelling in the chatzer. So, in a, if you have just a structure there that you possess, that's not considered to be, that doesn't interfere, that doesn't identify you as one of the dwellers in the chatzer. But if you have something like a, uh, you know, something like a, uh, uh, you know, a, a storehouse or something like that in the property of the Chatzer, you're considered to be one of the dwellers in the Chatzer. So the Gemara, Rabbi Yehuda, Omer, no oser el makom dira bilvat. Rabbi Yehuda comes along and says, no. The only time that you prohibit, in other words, the only time you're considered to be a member of the Chatzer that you have to join in the Erovei Chatzerot is... If you have a makom dira, you have an actual dwelling place. So true, you, uh, you know, in the first list, uh, having an outdoor achsadra or mirpeset, just having a porch, 
That's not considered a makom dirah for sure. But neither would be a house of straw or a, uh, a cattle ranch or something like that. That's not considered a dwelling place either. So, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda said, Maseh beben napacha. There was a, a situation with ben napacha, shayu lo chamesh chatserot, beusha, that he had property in five different chatserot in usha. And the rabbis were asked, <coughs> does this guy have to participate in the Eruvei Chatzerot in all five Chatzerot? And if he doesn't participate, he's going to ruin it for everybody? He won't be able to carry? Even though he doesn't live there, he has property in them, but he doesn't live there. So they said, the, the rabbis said, no, only a bit dira, only a dwelling place. Counts. Okay, the Gemara asks, Bet dira sal katatach. Does it really mean it has to be a house? Bet dira. Ela ema mekom dira. It has to be a place of dwelling. In other words, a place where you actually live. Not just that you own property in the chater. Living it, it was never made clear if it means sleeping or eating. Well, that's still going to be discussed. So my makom dira, what does it mean, the place of dwelling? Rav Amar makom pita. Rav says, the place where your bread is. That's exactly what you just asked about. We turn to Amud Aleph of Ayn Gimel. Makom pita, the place of your bread. Ushmuel Amar makom lina. Shmuel says, the place that you sleep. That's the issue. So since this guy owns property, but he doesn't actually eat or sleep in the place where he has the property, it's not an issue. There is an objection. This is talking about all different kinds of workers, agricultural workers or farm workers. So they're shepherds or the people who watch the um, drying uh, figs in the, in the uh, fields or the people who take care of the, you know, take care of the uh, various um, you know, uh, agricultural related things. So they stay out in the fields. Stay out in the fields during the summer times. Uh, so Bizman Shadarkad Lalin Ba'ir, if they normally come in to stay in the city at night, they don't sleep out there. They stay there during the day, they come in the city. So Harei and Ganshe'ir, their Tehum is defined by the people of the city because really they come home to the city. However, Bizman Shadarkad Lalin Ba'sadeh, Yeshlem Al Paim Lechol Ruach. So then if they normally sleep out in the fields, so then on Shabbat also we give, we define their Tehum from the place that they sleep. 2,000 amot in every direction from the field, not from the city. So what do you see from that? What, why is that a metive? It's an objection to rav. Because it's saying, you see, it doesn't go by where they eat, it goes by where they sleep. Even if they eat in the city, since they sleep out in the fields, the fields are considered to be their, their location. That's where they live. So rav answers... Hatam anan sahade de imam tulahu rifta hatam tefe nichalahu. It's not a good example because if you were to bring the food to the people who live out, who are staying out in the fields, they'd like it even more if they had takeout, if they had delivery. They, lo- they just don't have that luxury, so they have to come to the city to eat. But really, they would prefer to have their food out in the fields. They're only coming into the city under duress. But under a normal circumstance, we look at where a person eats as the definition of where they would consider their home. Okay, so therefore, really out in the fields is their home. They sleep out in the fields, that's true. But they would prefer to eat out there as well. They just have to come into the city because nobody's going to bring them food. They don't have servants to bring them food. They are the servants. Okay, so now the Gemara says, Amar Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef said, Lo shem had shmata. I never, Rav Yosef, remember he had Alzheimer's or he had dementia. He lost his, he forgot his learning later in life. So oftentimes he would say to Abaye, a student, I never heard this before. And Abaye would say, yes you did. So he said, I never heard this before, what Rav says, that we go by the food where a person eats. I never heard this before. And Amar uh, Abaye, Abaye said to him, At Amrat Nialan. You told it to us. This is a very common thing. Abaye will remind him. And this is the situation. This is the context. Because it says in the Mishnah that if 
brothers eat with their father, but they sleep in their own house. They're considered separate. Ve'amrin and lachan, we said to you, shemaminam b'kom lina gorem. We said, ah, here's a proof that the place where you sleep is really what defines your residence, not the place where you eat. The Amratlan and you said to us, Allah about it, Amarav Yudamarav, Bim Kable Piras Shanu. No, really, it goes by where you eat. We're talking about Mikable Piras. We're talking about people who their father supports them. So they eat in their house. But when it says they eat on the table of their father, it means they're supported financially by their father. So that's why if there's nobody else in the chatzer, or if one of them is the one holding the the eruv, then we can consider them all as one, because economically speaking, they're all one. But practically speaking, it goes by where you eat, and they actually eat in their own homes. They don't, they don't eat actually physically with their father every night. They have dinner at their dad's house. That's not how it works. So therefore, they are considered to be independent groups whenever what? Whenever there's another group. In other words, whenever there's another group in the Chatzar, another household, now they're considered to be independent households. When they dominate the entire Chatzar, we don't have, or when they are the recipients of the Eruv, we don't have to consider them separate. But relative to other groups... When they put the the eruv in someone else's house, now they're considered independent, vis-a-vis the other person. Okay, so that's the, and this is like when David Melech says, "Vayu beochaleshul hanecha." He says to Shlomo about bnei barzilai agiladi for the bnei barzilai agiladi taaseches. Do kindness for the sons of barzilai. Vayu beochaleshul hanecha. They should eat at your table. That doesn't mean every single night he has to have them over. He, he can never have a night where he doesn't have them over for dinner? Every single No. It means you're going to support them. You're going to provide them with food. That's Ochle Shulchanecha. And that's what it means in the Mishnah. So Rav Yosef himself had told the students, it doesn't mean they're physically eating with him. Because then they would actually all be considered one. Okay? They're considered independent because they actually eat in their homes. In most circumstances, they're considered to be separate households because they eat in their homes, even though they're supported by their father.